This week's parsha is called Titzave, and Titzave means you should command the Jewish people. And it continues the theme of last week. It's the Almighty's instructions to Moshe to motivate the people, to instruct the people to prepare the tabernacle was last week and the various vessels of the tabernacle and coverings and all that. And this week it continues with uh, one more leftover vessel from last week at the end of the Parsha. But primarily it's going to be about the the instructions to to make and produce the vestments, the clothing of the high priests and the regular priests, the regular Kohanim. Uh, now, there's an interesting curiosity that everyone points out here in this Parsha. It's that the name of Moshe is not mentioned. Moreover, it, it appears that it was actually avoided. So it says, Va'ata tetzav, and now you shall instruct the Jewish people in the first verse of the Parsha which normally it says, the Almighty tells Moshe, go tell the people. It doesn't have that introduction. Uh, again, a few verses later, uh, in chapter 28, verse 1, and you bring Aaron, your brother, and his children close to you amongst the Jewish people. It's avoiding using the term Moshe. It's just a strange thing, especially because Moshe is the primary subject, human subject of this parsha. It's all a conversation between God and Moshe, and Moshe's, his name is not even mentioned. It's deliberately avoided. And there's a few answers given to this question. I want to give a few of them here. So first of all, today is the seventh day of Adar. The seventh day of Adar was both the birthday and the death day, the yard site of Moshe. And every single year, this date is marked in this Parsha. Parsha of Tetzaveh is always the Parsha that coincides with the yard side of Moshe. So some have theorized that, uh, the, that the Almighty was aware of the death date of Moshe, and in order to mark his passing, the fact that Moshe is gone, he's missing, he's gone from the Parsha as well. That's one answer given. I think it's, uh, it's interesting to know that today happens to be just today, the seventh day of Adar is the same day that Moshe was born and the same that he died, which is a theme that we see across a lot of great Jewish leaders, is that they die on the same day that's their birthday. And the reason is because God allots people a certain amount of years, and someone's behavior can can determine, will determine whether or not they are able to maximize all those years. Moshe, the greatest tzaddik that has ever lived, he was allotted 120 years to the day, and nothing of his behavior over his life caused that figure to be diminished, and then hence he died on his birthday. He had a complete 120 years that he was allotted to. Um, so that's one reason given why motion and image doesn't appear. But there's a few other very interesting ones, and some of them that really set the tone for the Parsha. First of all, in next week's Parsha, we, we learn about the golden calf. So this, this, there's a little bit of a, a chronological oddity that... Everything that we've been talking about, the tabernacle and the vestments of the high priest of this parsha, all happened after the sin of the golden calf, after Sinai. Uh, but the Torah decided to not, deli- not directly go from the height of Sinai to the depths of the golden calf. Instead, it interjected with events and instructions that happened after the golden calf uh, to put a little bit of a buffer between these two. But next week, we're going to read about the golden calf, and we're going to find out that Moshe begins to lobby and intercede upon behalf of the Jewish people that God wanted to destroy them, and he's going to try to save them. And at one point in time, Moshe makes this ultimatum, so to speak, with God, and tells him, if you're not willing to forgive the people, erase me from your book. Moshe is saying, like, I don't want to have a part of this. You, you are telling, you are suggesting, you're proposing that we'll destroy the whole nation and we'll start from scratch with Moshe. Moshe says, I have absolutely no part of it. And you know what? If you're going ahead with your plan, take me out of the Torah. And we're told in the Talmud that when a tzaddik makes a curse, even if the conditions of the curse are not met, still the result of the curse happens. So, for example, Jacob. 
Jacob told uh, Lavan that whomever you find the 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 uh, the idol that he was missing, whoever you find, whoever's hands you find them, they're gonna die. And he thought no one has them, but really someone did have them, and indeed Rachel died. That's one example. There's many examples of this where a tzaddik makes a curse, and even though he may it may be conditional on other things, or maybe not be the way he intended, but still uh, the Almighty will fulfill it. So therefore, we have a parsha that. It's not the entire Torah, but it's a significant section that stands on its own of the Torah. And Moshe said, erase me from your book. And indeed, he was erased from the book. And that's why it's evident that otherwise Moshe's name would have appeared. It's not like, it, it's not like the content of the Parsha obviated the need for Moshe's name to be written. No, to the contrary. The content of the parsha mandated that Moshe's name should be written, but it was expunged because of Moshe's self-curse. Now, I once heard a reason why... So why does it appear in this parsha? If Moshe's name had to be erased from one parsha, let it be erased from any other parsha. Why is it the parsha directly before the one that has the curse? I once heard this. I don't know if it's true. So I remember when I was a child, I heard this, that Moshe... Uh, made a curse that he's going to be erased from a certain parsha, and every week the Almighty said, "We're going to deflect it to the next week. We're going to we're going to punt it. We're going to kick the can down the road." Is what the Almighty said. And then he kept on kicking it down the road until he got to the last parsha, i.e., the fifty-fourth one after the one where in which the curse was given, and that's the last one, and that's the only one that the Almighty said, "Okay, this is the." This is the last one. We have to fill the curse, and that's why we'll put it over here. That's an interesting reason I heard. I don't know if it's true or not. Another reason, the essential theme of the Parsha is the role of the Kohen. The Kohen, he's the one who's going to do all the sacrifices. He's going to be the one, him, the family, the tribe, are going to be overseeing the tabernacle. All the sacrifices of the Jewish people are going to have to filter through them. They're going to be the ones in charge of prayer on the high holidays, on Yom Kippur, the Kohen Gadol is the one who, who does all the prayers. And there is a risk to assume that the Kohen is a necessary intermediate, intermediary between Jew and God. Moreover, with Moshe, more broadly, there's a concern that because Moshe is one who's given us the Torah, therefore the way to get back to God, so to speak, is also through Moshe. And that's a mistake that a lot of other religions have, uh, have stumbled upon, where they look as a uh, at a man to be a necessary filter between another man and God. Even Moshe, the greatest prophet that ever, has ever lived, and also the clearest channel of communication that God has ever given to our world, because Moshe is just a funnel who's going to give directly the Torah of the Almighty to the Jewish people, even someone as connected to the spiritual spheres, he is not someone that we need to use as a stepping stone to God. And therefore, in the Parsha, that the entire Parsha can lead us to the erroneous conclusion that we need to go through the Kohens uh, in order to reach God, we're specifically told that Moshe does not, is not needed, so to speak. Don't make the mistake that to achieve anything great in your life, you need another man to help you connect to God. So there's another answer given as to why Moshe's name doesn't appear in the parsha, and this is brought up by the Baal Turim at the beginning of the parsha, and he said like this: the Kohen and the Levite are both from the tribe of Levi. So how was it determined who was going to be the Kohen and who was going to be the Levite? So initially, Moshe, because he was the king and he was the leader and he was the greatest brother, so to speak, Moshe and Aaron, he was the greatest one of them. He was going to be the Kohen, whereas Aaron was going to be the Levite. And in fact, if you look at the beginning of Exodus, Aaron is called Aaron the Levite, even though we know Aaron's really the Kohen. So there was a, there was a, sh- a shift here. There was, a, there was a demotion. Moshe had a demotion, and Aaron had a promotion. And that actually happened in this week's Parsha. Uh, a Levite and a Kohen are both, uh, they're both part of the clergy, so to speak, class of the Jewish people, but the Kohen is on a higher level. So if you have a, to read the Torah, first the Kohen comes, and then the Levite. In the temple, the actual work was done by the Kohen. 
the Levites, they had different jobs, but they were the ushers that would open and close the doors. They would, they would be in charge of the music. They would be the, the band. Actual services and actual sacrifices and actual work, the higher spiritual work was done by the Kohen exclusively. In the uh, third verse of the Parsha, Moshe is told to take Aaron and Aaron's four sons and to consecrate them as Kohens. And essentially by doing that, Moshe is going to switch positions with Aaron. Moshe is going to be the Levite and Aaron is going to be the Kohen. So this Parsha essentially is the description of or Moshe's role in this Parsha is that he is going to have to hand his crown over, the crown of the Kohen, over to Aaron and he's going to be left without that crown. And therefore, in order to not rub salt in his wounds, the Torah doesn't always interject with Moshe's name. It doesn't say, oh, Moshe lost this and Moshe lost that. So look at every little stuff that Moshe had to tell his brother that he's now in charge of. In order to save Moshe's dignity, well, not dignity, but to have the proper respect and to not point out his loss, the Torah avoided to u- the use of his name. All future Kohanes are direct descendants of Aaron and Aaron's four sons. You, you notice in verse 1 of chapter 28, it says, Aaron, Nadav, and Aviu, Elazar, and Isamar, these four sons of Aaron. Two of them are going to die tragically, we'll see in the book of Leviticus. But what that means is that Aaron and those four sons are going to be Kohanes. Now, Aaron's grandsons, grandchildren, are not going to be Kohanes. They're still going to be Levites. Only those five people, Aaron and his four sons, and any of their future descendants, not the ones who are already born. There's only one exception that we're going to read about in the book of Numbers, and that's the son of Elazar, the grandson of Aaron, who was born at the time, whose name is Pinchas. He was the one who was elevated to a stature of a Kohen post facto. With the exception of that, there's no one who became a Kohen who was not a direct descendant of Aaron and not of an Aviyah and Lazarus. There's a, there's a great joke about the guy who came to the rabbi and wanted to be a Kohen. And uh, he says, well, you know... I can't make you a Kohen. So he says, actually, I go to the uh, guy down the block. You know, he's a little bit more liberal. <laughs> he says, uh, I, I want to be a Kohen. It's so important for me. Um, I'll pay whatever it takes. He says, I don't know. My rabbinic conscience doesn't allow me to do it. Fine. He sends him out. And he goes all the way down to the end of the block, the most, lo- most liberal guy. And he says to him, uh, make me a Kohen, Rabbi, make me a Kohen. And... He uh, says, I don't know if I can do it. But I'll pay you $100,000. Okay, fine. He doesn't have such a big conscience anymore. Fine, he does it. He makes says, if I pronounce you a coin, and he says, just by the way, why do you want to be a coin? So he says, well, why was it important for you to be a coin? He says, well, my father was a coin. My grandfather was a coin. I, I, I thought I for sure have to be a coin. That's the, uh, that's the joke they say. Okay, so, um, so, so that's how... That's, uh, one of the major events that happens in the Parsha. Now, the beginning of the Parsha starts off very briefly with the instruction of Moshe, Moshe to, 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 to fundraise from the people oil for the menorah. Last week we read about the menorah. And this week we're told what to fundraise from the Jewish people um, olive oil, but virgin olive oil that is squeezed with the express intention that that be used for the menorah. Mm-hmm in order to have a constant light of the menorah. It's interesting to note that the term that it uses over here is a very strong wording. It says, go command the people. And we know from elsewhere that the term uh, that the Torah uses as an instruction uh, is generally a little bit of a, uh, of, of, a, uh, of a weaker term. Whereas over here, titzave is always used as a very strong term terminology to encourage and coax and command the people because they are reluctant to do so. Why? So we're told in the Talmud, whenever it says the word command, it's a reference to a monetary loss. It's very expensive, it's prohibitively expensive, and therefore people need ever more encouragement to continue doing doing that. 
The question that was raised is that this terminology of titzava, of to command, does not appear in last week's parsha. When we're describing all this gold and all this silver and all this, uh, all these gems and all these things that we have to raise that seem to be a lot more expensive than olive oil. And even olive oil, okay, so it's only the first squeeze, but still, my gosh, how much does it cost? Doesn't seem like it's so, so much in absolute terms compared to stuff we've already raised for previously. So what's the idea? Why, why is the Torah so concerned that people are going to be reluctant to give the oil? So I heard an interesting answer that it's a lot easier for someone to give to something that they s- assume continuity for. Like to, if you want to fundraise for a new building, like the building will last for 75 years and it will have your name emblazoned on it and it will be a, a fixed edifice for perpetuity. Whereas operations, the day-to-day expenses, so to speak, that an, an organization or institution needs to continue, that's much harder. So someone says, oh, I, I could donate the menorah. Yeah, it's gold, it's very expensive, but there'll be a menorah, and it'll be my menorah. I can point to my kids, look at that. I, you know, I donate a little bit part of that. That's, that's, you know, and that'll be around for hundreds of years. Whereas the oil, well, it's expensive oil. You're going to squeeze and use it and be all gone. And they only use the first drop and you can't, you can't crush the whole olive. So I think how many olives you have to use to get the oil that people are more reluctant to do. And therefore the Torah has to use a very strong uh, terminology to say, no, you have to encourage people to give even to ongoing operations. Okay, so there's an interesting thing here. We see that the, uh, in verse uh, 21 here, that Aaron and his sons, they're already arranging the menorah before they, in the following verse, become Kohanes. So it seems like there's a universal lesson that applies not only to a Kohen with regards to the menorah. It's an interesting idea, and I think it's one of the themes to use when trying to understand this parsha, is we're describing vessels and vestments that we've never seen before. And you know what? Even if we did see it, we're not coins. Well, many of us aren't coins, and we're certainly not a coin god, though. What's the value for us? We're always going to try to pull out tangible lessons for us. We see that Aaron and his sons are already tinkering with the menorah and the oil before they become a coin, and that's trying to illuminate us that there are var- various lessons that are universal in the menorah that apply to all of us and lessons that we can use. So I want to give you a, a, a selection here of some ideas that are commonly brought down from the menorah. The menorah was used to represent Torah in one way. Uh, and moreover, we know, we saw last week, that the ark was a... Uh, the ark was a, a repository for the tablets, so it too was used for Torah. And there's various different explanations why. If you have one for Torah, why do you need, why do you need the other one, for, other one for Torah? Why do you need the menorah plus the ark, both as symbols of Torah? That's a question. There's many answers given: uh, written Torah, oral Torah, hidden Torah, revealed Torah, etc. But either way, there, um, the idea of lighting a candle, kindling a light, as a way of educating where the teacher or the parent has a candle and they take the candle and they hold it to the wick and then they light it and they transfer their light without their own light being diminished and then they could take the candle away and it could light on its own. That's always used as a metaphor of education. Parents' goal is to prepare a child for life the day too can be a shining candle, a fiery torch, if you will, uh, a beacon of light on their own merit. It's important for us to try to think of a plan, a strategy to make our children and our students that they could, they don't need to have the apron strings and being attached to us and they can only thrive under our auspices. That's one idea. But another idea, and that is that when they would light the candles, there's a halacha that regardless of the length of the night, they would always put in the same amount of oil. And I think that teaches us a very powerful lesson. We sometimes like to classify our children and put them and say, well, this kid is more gifted. This kid should maybe become a welder, you know? This guy should go to trade school. 
let him just, you know, he's not, he, he's not cut out for the more sophisticated elements of life. Become a plumber, I don't know, become a mechanic, right? Not everyone needs to go to college, right? And that, I think, is problematic because every child has potential that we don't even know. We don't know what the potential of a child is. The potential, potential is infinite. And therefore, even though it's a, so to speak, uh, it's a, it's a summer night, so it's a much shorter night, you have to put in the same amount of oil. We have to invest in our children regardless of what we think their future potential may or may not be. Some interesting ideas that we could use to try to bring these concepts a little bit more, uh, make them a little more relevant to our lives. Now, uh, we're to, uh, Moshe is told to bring Aaron and his sons close to him from amongst the Jewish people. Again, we said Moshe is being instructed to, in, to partake in self-sacrifice, where he has to be the one to, uh, to inaugurate and consecrate his successor that effectively means, uh, means his own demotion. So I saw something very interesting. The word in Hebrew here, va'ata hakrev alecha, the word hakrev means to bring close, but it has the same root as the word korban, or sacrifice. So if you read it, you could potentially read it as va'ata hakrev alecha, you should sacrifice for yourself, i.e. you should engage in self-sacrifice and that will provide you a measure of atonement. There was a reason why Moshe is being demoted, and specifically Aaron is being promoted. If you remember the beginning of Exodus, Moshe was told by God, go, go down to Egypt and bring them out, and Moshe has all these, pro- all these re- refusals, all these various refusals. And as a result, Moshe lost a certain degree of closeness to God because he was refusing it. On his own merit, he says, I don't want this close. I don't want to be the representative. Let someone else be the representative. Let Aaron be the representative. Let someone else. And therefore, he got what he asked for. He said, oh, you don't want to be my representative? Okay. You want Aaron to be the representative? Okay, you get that. And you ask, you got what you asked for. Aaron will be the coin, and you'll be demoted. Moreover, you're going to be the one to have to place the crown upon his head. And by doing that, that will be equal to a carbon, to a sacrifice, and you will achieve atonement for, uh, for that misdeed. And right away we're told that Moshe is instructed to make the holy garments for Aaron, his brother, for holiness and for glory. And the list of garments, we get six of them in verse 4, is a choshen, which is a breastplate, and we'll be describe these all in detail. An aphod, which is some sort of like, a, it's like an apron of sorts. A robe, a tunic, a, 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 a turban, a hat, and a belt. So that's the sitch that we get over here. And they are all made out of gold and blue wool and purple wool and red wool and linen. And the Torah is going to spend the rest, most of the rest of the Parsha describing in great detail how these garments are made, what they look like, what, what, what shape they are, etc. Okay, so we have a description here of eight garments. We're going to get to the eight garments. Four of them are universal. Four of them are all Kohanes. Whenever they do any work in the temple, they wear the four garments. There's four additional garments that are given exclusively to the Kohen God doll. And he's the only one who wears those four extra garments. What's the idea behind these clothing? We have very elaborate descriptions of garments, but it seems like it's somewhat of an externality. It doesn't, it doesn't seem to, it doesn't seem to be something that we would typically focus on as Jews, the details of someone's clothing. It doesn't seem to be so critical. Yet here it is. I think broadly speaking, generally, we could say that that's essentially the idea of the temple and everything that happens inside the temple, is that it is physical, but it's the power of the temple and the services in the temple is that it's able to take things that on, under ordinary circumstances would be mundane, would be physical, would be earthly, would be something we don't focus on, and it's able to elevate it. Thus, the sacrifices, the states that, are, that they're eating, the 
clothing of the high priest, all those things don't seem to they don't, don't seem to be consequential. They shouldn't have a place in the Torah. They seem to be not so critical, not so important. Yet we're told these are the exact ways they have to be they have to be made. And there's seventy two bells under the under the robe of the Kohen Gadol. And if he's missing one, we have to he has to be executed. That's it. That's a, that's an executable offense. Pretty remarkable. The question is why. So, so I think, just simply speaking, we could say that that's the idea. There's some sort of power given to this physical representation of spiritual ideas, and they are married at, in the temple. The spiritual and the physical are intermixed in such a way that even the physical becomes spiritual, and the spiritual becomes physical, and it's just this crossover. That's, I think, one idea. The Talmud does say an interesting statement that the power of the clothing of the high priest is that they themselves will provide atonement. Just the coin wearing us wearing a certain clothing will provide atonement. And moreover, it goes through the various garments of the coin gadol, and it says, what does each one of them atone for? For example, it says that the tunic that atones for murder. And the coin wears the tunic and, and mur- any murder accidental or otherwise, that happens, that's how it could pr- be provided atonement. Very powerful idea. Doesn't, Gemara doesn't explain why, but it does invoke the fact that when uh, Joseph was kidnapped and sold by his brothers, they took a tunic, also called a sonus, and they dunked it into blood and said, oh, they were invoking, maybe, uh, maybe Joseph was murdered. Uh, that's something what the brothers did was, you know, inco- unconscionable. How'd they do that, right? And the Torah says, okay, now I want you to make a tunic, a holy tunic, a tunic that's to provide atonement in the temple. Uh, the pants that we haven't mentioned here, but the pants, uh, they're covering the reproductive organs and thus it atones for any sins of illicit sexuality. The, the hat, a turban that just looks really nice and tall, well, that atones for anyone that was tall and aloof over the people. The belt atones, atones for various illicit thoughts. The choshen, uh, the breastplate, which is called the breastplate of judgment, atones for any misdeeds of judgment. The aphod, which is that, uh, that apron-like garment, atones for idolatry. And lastly, the me'il, the, uh, the robe, that has those bells in the bottom, it makes all this noise every time the Kohen Gadol moves, it atones for sins of noise, i.e. gossip. That's what the, which is an interesting way of lens to look at these, at these vestments, not just random clothing that is used by the Kohen, but actually these are part of whatever's happening in the temple is, is part of, the, uh, th- th- these are part of it and they provide atonement as the rest of the sacrifices. Yeah, so let, let, let's try to see what these things look like. So just quickly here, we don't have so much time today. The aphode looks like a little apron around the waist, but it has these two distinctive straps that go up from the back, like, uh, like, uh, um, like suspenders, but they only stop at the shoulders. On the shoulders, there's these, uh, two stones, uh, on which each one of the stones, there are engraved six names of the tribes. It's going to connect with, uh, with rings to the breastplate in the middle. That's going to connect in the bottom as well. Very striking looking garment. Not one that we've seen, like, we don't, not one that we typically would wear. And Torah describes it in great detail. The belt, the linen, the garment, the purple, all that. You can read it. Um, the signature highlight of it is these two square stones on the shoulders of the Kohen Gadol on which there's six names of the tribes on one stone and six names of the tribes of the other stone. It connects to the Choshe Mishpat, the breastplate of judgment, which is uh, made out of fabric, but it also has these boxes in which these 12 rectangular stones, uh, it's three across and four, uh, uh, there's four rows of three columns each for a total of 12. And then you have the breastplate, and that's also has the 12. Each stone has the name of one of the tribes, and it connects to the aphod on top. And the breastplate has a flap. It has a flap on the back of it, a fabric flap made out of the same material as the aphod, and it would fold inward. And inside, they would put the urim vitumim. 
uh, inside that flap. It'll be closed. And the Urvatumim is a parchment on which Moshe wrote the names of God or name, name or names of God. And that gave the Choshen, the breastplate, some magical powers. And that would be a way, uh, it would be a proxy for prophecy where someone would want to talk to God and they would go to the Kohen and the Kohen would use the Urvatumim and the lights would, uh, the, the, the stones would light up and certain letters would light up and it would give a message. So you want to, should we go to war or not? I don't know. What do you, what do you, you know, we could talk about it in our conference. We could also ask God. Why well, do you do that? You go to the Kohen. You say, okay, should we do this or not? Matters of national, uh, national matters of importance. And then the various stones would light up and you'd have to, the Kohen would have to assemble it. We have to unscramble those stones to try to figure out the message. And that is a pretty, uh, pretty cool aspect of the, of these vestments. Let, let, let's try to understand here a little bit about the Choshen and the Eifo. So both of them contain stones, both of them stones with the names of the tribes. And the breastplate's written on the, on the chest near the heart of Aaron. Now, why did Aaron merit that? So there's an interesting backstory to this. If you remember, when Moshe and Aaron, when Moshe was being prepositioned by God to go get the Jewish people, he was resistant because he thought Aaron was going to be envious. Uh, and God tells him, well, don't worry about Aaron, because when he'll see you, he'll be happy in his heart. And Aaron is the only one, like we mentioned when we talked about this in the beginning of Exodus, Aaron was the only one that, in the history that the Torah testifies has no shred of envy. And therefore, of course, Aaron was joyous in his heart. He merited to have this particular wonderful vestment on his heart as a representation of his uh, of his selflessness and his piety, and that was given to him and his children. And the idea of the Ephod and the Choshen both having the names of the tribes is interesting. And the reason why, well, why does that have to be repeated? So I saw I saw a uh, I saw an explanation that the names of the sons of Jacob on the ephod on the shoulders of the Kohen Gadol, that actually refers to the actual twelve sons of Jacob, whereas the Choshen, the one on the breastplate of the Kohen Gadol, refers not to the sons of Jacob but to the tribes of the Jewish people that are named after the sons of Jacob. One of them is more to invoke the righteousness of the sons of Jacob. Another one of them is to uh, to invoke the needs of the Jewish people as they are comprised by these 12 tribes. That's what I saw. And I actually have a proof uh, to this idea from the Talmud in the book of Sota. The Talmud is describing Joseph when he was he was being seduced by his his master's wife, and he almost capitulated. And the Talmud describes a very dramatic happening when Joseph was at the point of making the final decision what to do. Talmud says that at that time, he saw the visage of Jacob, his father, in the window. And that image, that countenance of Jacob told him, in the future your brothers are going to be engraved in an aphod, and you are destined to be engraved amongst them. Do you want your name to be removed, to be expunged? And everyone will say, oh, we have another brother, but he became a patron of prostitutes? That's what the, that visage told Joseph. That in the future, they're going to be on this aphod. My question was, well, they're going to be in the aphod, but they're also going to be in the Hoshan. They're going to be on the uh, on the straps of the apron, but also they're going to be the breastplate. So why did Jacob tell him that you're going to be removed from this stone, the stone on the shoulder, not the stones on the chest? But according to this understanding, it makes a lot of sense. The names on the shoulder, that refers to the actual sons of Jacob, the 12 humans that were sons of Jacob, and they were all meritorious. If Joseph sins, well, he loses his stature and he's going to be removed from that list. He may still be part of the Jewish people. We have elements of Andas that are less righteous than other elements. That's okay. His name would still be on the Hoshen, but 
the names of the sons of Jacob as in their righteousness that he would no longer be able to uh, to uh, he would no longer be eligible to be in should he sin. That makes a it's a proof to the idea, but also it gives us an understanding a little bit of why we have both of these names being engraved twice. One of them for the individuals and one of them for their tribes. So uh, then we're told to make, Moshe's told to make the ne'il, the robe, entirely out of wool. There's an opening on the head for the uh, the head opening. Can't rip it. On the bottom you have all these pomegranates and bells and gold and pomeg- gold bells and then a pomegranate and then a gold bell one after another all the way around. And here's the verse that we mentioned earlier. It must be an Aaron or its minister. It shall, its sound shall be heard when he enters the sanctuary before Hashem and when he leaves so that he does not die. That's what we see. That, it, that, that He has to have all the sounds in it or else he doesn't die. And we're told, like we mentioned earlier, that the, this is an atonement for, for gossip. Uh, the chattering of gossip is cleansed by the chattering of the me'il. And I think it's apropos that Aaron, who did not have any envy of Moshe, he's going to be the one who is going to atone for gossip. Because at the root of gossip is underlying envy. When someone is envious of someone of another person, they're not willing to see them succeed and flourish, then they are more likely to gossip amongst them. Aaron was someone who was delighted in his heart that His brother achieved greatness, had no shred of envy, therefore he's the one who could teach us a lesson about uh, about atoning for gossip. I think there's another interesting lesson that my my father likes to say over this parsha, is that you can imagine what it's like. You have the high priest, Aaron, and then there's all the minor priests. They're doing all their work, and there's tons of meat. Can you imagine? There's tons of meat coming in and out every day. It's a happy place in the world for people that are on napkins. It's Disneyland for Atkins uh, dieters. And they're sitting around and they're eating their steaks. And then what happens if Aaron walks in? Everyone suddenly straightens and sits and, you know, everyone's, everyone's all nervous. Oh. But the mind tells Aaron, okay, I want you to have bills. I want everyone to, your, your, your walking around should be announced by everyone should know when Aaron comes, don't surprise them. And that's a good lesson, I think, for parents. Parents, we like to think we're FBI agents. Like, we're, 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 we're investigating your kids. And you said this, and I have evidence, photographic evidence, that you lied. Oh, I got you. And that's a very terrible blunder, because we're telling our children, this is what you are, and that's, unfit, that, that, that's unshakable. You can't change that. You're a liar. Oh, I got you. And I think a better lesson would be is to have these little bells that we walk around with to not catch our kids. Let, 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 let them know that, no, no, my, my father thinks I'm, my parent, my father, my mother, they think I'm a really per- great person, and then they're more likely to actually uphold that. Whereas if we catch them, and in their eyes, uh, their stature is diminished, in our eyes, then it's more likely they're going to uh, behave thusly. Uh, we read about the rest of the, uh, of the vestments, the head plate, the tunic, the ordinary clothing of the of the Kohanes, there's an inauguration ceremony. We're told about the daily sacrifices. And lastly, we end off the Parsha with the creation of the altar inside the tabernacle.